So we often ask ourselves the question, how far is AI going to go? But we seem to be missing a much more important and pressing question. And this question is, where is humanity going in the meantime? You see, I have been developing AI solutions for many years now. But the first time I felt really terrified and scared about the potential future was not very long ago. And I would like to tell you this story. My father was a very remarkable person with a very remarkable life. Um, I remember when I was in still in high school, he wanted to write a story about his life. He wanted to write a book. And he drafted the first chapter of this book, and he sent it over my email so that I can read it and give him some feedback. I remember that I received this email, but I kept postponing it. I would always say that I would read this tomorrow. And then the next day came. And then the next day came. And in two weeks' time, he asked me what I think about it. And I just had to tell him that I didn't find the time to do it. This emotionally hurt him a lot. And this quickly became one of the biggest regrets in my life. Because two years ago, he passed away from cancer. And he never got to write this book. He never got to leave anything behind him. And this disappointment was one of the main reasons for that. And I do remember that I felt very bad about the fact that I couldn't read anything about him because now I wanted to ask him all the questions. Now I wanted to learn more about his life. But it was a bit too late for that. Until a couple of months ago, when my mother found in an old cupboard that she was cleaning a dozen of letters that were handwritten by him that she sent her. These were letters that he wrote from the time in which he was uh, working abroad. And he sent these letters to her, and they were very old. Um, they were before I was born. And there was really nothing special inside those letters. He was explaining about his daily life. He was explaining about his things that happened in work, how he was frustrated with my mother for her not replying back to him. But I st still felt very emotional reading those letters because it was just him, his excitements, his intentions, the small little things that uh, made him feel scared about stuff. And um, it was as if a small piece of him was still living on these papers. And that day, I felt like I learned more about him than I ever did during any conversation that I've had with him. And I couldn't help it but imagine the same scenario with my kids one day. But then it struck me, because imagine 50 years from now, when somebody stumbles upon a long text written by somebody in 2025, would it really have the same meaning? How likely do you think that this text is going to be something which is AI generated? And think about it. Every year in Graceland, thousands of people line up to see the guitar of Elvis Presley. Now you can take the exact same replica of this guitar and you can replace it. And the people will definitely not be able to make any difference. But as soon as they understand that this is not the original, it's immediately going to lose its value. Because it's never really about the guitar. It's never really about the letter. It's never really about the piece of artwork. It's always about the story of the person behind it. And nowadays, AI is involved with writing books instead of us. It's involved with artistically expressing itself instead of us. A lot of times it's involved in thinking instead of us as well. But what I do believe is that this is actually just the beginning of the problem. And the future which is about to unfold is more terrifying than anything that you can imagine, or at least it could be. But before I explain what this future is to you, I would like to get something out of the way. You see, all of these movies that you see here, Westland, iRobot, The Matrix, The Terminator, and a dozen of other movies, they all share the same narrative. And this is what most people believe is going to be the future of AI. It's the same narrative of some artificial and intelligent beings at some point gaining sentience and rebelling against the creator. But you see, this story is not unique to the age of technology. It actually predates AI. If you look at very old novels like Frankenstein or the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's still there. 
And the reason why it resonates so much in our culture is because it underlies a very fundamental fear. This is the fear of losing control. I believe that this is the last thing that we should be worrying about. AI rebelling against us is just as likely as the calculator sitting on your desk, waking up in the middle of the night and deciding to do some calculations because it feels like it. It cannot happen. For AI to rebel against us, it needs its own personal desires and emotions. To have personal desires and emotions, it needs consciousness. Consciousness requires a true understanding of the world around it. Now, when we ask a very thought-provoking question, ChatGPT, or any other language model, it might look like it has understanding, but in reality, it's just one giant calculator that calculates the most probable word that a human being is going to use in a sentence. It's actually very stupid. It doesn't have that understanding. And this is the reason why I believe that this is never going to happen, unless we completely change the way we build those systems. However, I also believe that the future is actually much more horrifying than what you see here on the screen. And I do believe that it's going to unfold in three stages. And I would like to present these three stages to you using three narratives, each narrative building on top of the previous one. The first one is called The Trial by Franz Kafka. See, this is a novel which Franz Kafka wrote, and it's about the protagonist called Joseph K. Joseph K is being accused and he is being arrested. And the story is really terrifying because he's never really told what he is accused of. He is rendered completely powerless by the bureaucracy. And because he doesn't even know what crime he has committed, he cannot even defend himself. So eventually he gets executed. And if you think that this is science fiction, let me tell you that. In the United States currently, you have AI tools which decide whether somebody should stay in jail or not. Banks use tools that decide whether they should give out loans to somebody or not. Companies use AI tools to decide whether somebody should be hired for a job or not. And exactly like the Kafka novel, all of these tools cannot explain themselves. We do not really understand why they make certain decisions. So this is the first stage. The first stage is when we stop understanding AI. And the second stage is when AI stops understanding us. Which brings us to the next novel. It's not a novel, really. It's actually a short story which was written by William Jacobs, and it's called The Monkey's Ball. You see, in this story, what happens? You have a family that receives a magical talisman. This magical talisman can grant three wishes. Out of excitement, the father decides to wish for money. And he does get granted this wish, but it comes as a compensation for the death of his son. And the other two wishes follow a very similar storyline. Story all of the wishes are granted, but not exactly as intended. And they're twisted in meaning when they're being received. And to understand how this is an analogy to what happens with AI, let me give you an example. Imagine that you have a robot, and you want to teach this robot how it can bring you some water when you're thirsty. Now, if you approach this with classical programming, you would probably give it very specific instructions. You would tell it how it should go and reach the cupboard, how it should open the cupboard, how it should fetch a glass, how it should turn on the tap, how it should fill in the glass, and how it should walk back to you to give you the glass of water. But if you approach this with AI, you do not really tell it any instructions. You just give it a go. And the aim of the AI is that it can figure itself out what it needs to do to achieve this goal. So it starts experimenting. It starts doing a lot of trials and errors, and eventually it learns that the fastest way for you to get water is if it just taps the entire water cooler over so that the water flows to your feet. Right? Technically, the objective is achieved. You now have water, but it's not really exactly what you, what you intended. And now, if you try to scale this problem a little bit, think about a very powerful network of autonomous agents that we will have sometime in the future. 
And let's say we give them a task. Suppose that this task is fixing the acidification of the oceans, right? Now, if we didn't specifically tell it that we, it should preserve humans, it might try to achieve this task by just pumping a quarter of the atmosphere from, uh, of the oxygen from the atmosphere, right? So we need to be very specific inside the objective of that. But we cannot really foresee all the workarounds that an AI is going to find and how bad these workarounds can be for us. So this is the second stage. We first stopped understanding AI. AI stops understanding us. And now we have the perfect setup for the third and final stage. And I believe that this stage is going to be the most terrifying one out of them all. This is The Machine Stops. It's a novel written by E.M. Forster. In this novel, everybody is entirely machine dependent. It's about the idea that, that if we hand over our civilization to machines, we stop having the incentive to understand this civilization. Think about it. All of human knowledge, anything that we ever know, has been stored in books. It has been stored in books for centuries on end. But you see, books cannot run a civilization for us. So we always need to teach the next generation. And this makes an unbroken chain of tens of thousands of generations where we have some knowledge transfer. And now we ask ourselves the question, what happens when this chain breaks? I think we're just about to see what's going to happen. Because look at our children. In a world in which you have cheap dopamine, endless scrolling, what happens is they, oh, they already have reduced attention spans. They already have reduced social skills. And now we have artificial intelligence, which is a technology that is so powerful that it tempts them to give up thinking itself. So what world are we building where we have no critical thinking? We have no social skills. We have no ability to focus. Imagine a classroom. Imagine a classroom in which no ch child ever lifts his hand up. No child ever asks the question, why? No eyes ever light up. Imagine entire generations that never argue, never built, never wonder, because every single question that they might ask, they have an answer for it, and this answer is handed to them for free. But I think this is a world which, in which curiosity is replaced by silence. And by extinguishing curiosity, we extinguish the very last spark of what makes us human. But I believe that there is a way out. And I believe that there's three pillars to it. The first one is curiosity. Think about children. Each child is born a curious scientist. It asks a thousand questions every day. It experiments. It breaks the rules every once in a while. This curiosity is what actually motivates the child to figure things out on its own. So, a very clear sign of a failed educational system, and I'm pretty sure you've heard this many times before, is when a child asks the question, why do I need to study this? When will I ever need this in my life? This is a very common question that, that kids ask. And this is not laziness. This is a cry out, and this is a cry out that this curiosity has been extinguished. So if your child's questions annoy you, they annoy you more than they excite you, and if your educational system rewards obedience instead of rewarding uh, exploration, then what you're doing is you're not rewarding curiosity, you're extinguishing it. The second pillar is ambition. Ambition is what motivates us to achieve something more than what everybody else can achieve using the same tools. And in the age of AI, in the age of machines, it helps us lift ourse ourselves above the machines. So we cannot afford to teach our children that ambition is a vice. And third, last but not least, definitely not least, it's responsibility. Have you ever heard the story of Alexander Solzhenitsyn? When he was 26 years old, he ended up in a Soviet concentration camp. He could have blamed a thousand circumstances which were outside of his control for where he was. 
More than that, he had Hitler and Stalin to blame for where he was. But instead, what he decided to do is he decided to ask himself the question, what if I take responsibility for being here? What did I do in my past to maximize the probability of me ending up in this concentration camp? And what's going to happen if I fix those mistakes in the current moment? And this is what motivated him to write one of the books that brought the entire Soviet Union down and changed the entire course of history. So this is the type of lesson that we should be teaching our children, because responsibility is what teaches them that they're playing the main role in their life and that no machine can take it. So curiosity, ambition, and responsibility. This is our shield. It is what would help us to shape a future in which we decide what is going to happen with AI. And it's not going to be the other way around to where AI decides what is going to happen with us. And it is my call out to parents and to educators. Curiosity, ambition, responsibility. Thank you.